Next time, painting and travel visits Dinosaur National Park in Utah, where Sarah takes a close look at thousand-year-old petroglyphs, while Roger uses acrylics to paint one of the large cliffs near the entrance to the park. Driving to Dinosaur National Monument was one of our longer road trips, and we enjoyed every minute of the dramatic cross-country scenery changes, delivering us to our destination along the Colorado and Utah border. The relentless forces of erosion have revealed the previously buried remains of dinosaur bones, discovered by paleontologist Earl Douglas in 1909 giving the park its name. The day we arrived, the weather was clear and warm with beautiful clouds making dark shadows on the 100 plus million year old sandstone cliffs worn away by water and time. We watched the light and shadows made by the changing clouds and decided to set up our camera to film in slow motion, saving this peaceful reality for future viewing. This scene will be Roger's subject when we return to the studio. And later, we'll hike to a spot where ancient artists left their mark. I'm going to start this painting by using an 11 by 14 inch piece of masonite. And I've toned the board with some burnt sienna. On my palette, I have titanium white, ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, Indian yellow, cadmium yellow light, alizarin crimson, cadmium red, and three earth colors of burnt sienna, burnt umber, and yellow ochre. So on this palette setup, I basically have my three primary colors, blue, yellow, and red, and I have a warm and a cool color of each of those. Then I can use my earth tones just to supplement those. I'm using my computer monitor here with my reference photograph on it. And I'll begin just by mixing a dark color with ultramarine blue and some burnt umber. Any dark color will, will really do. And this is quite a simple composition. So I'll just um, start by drawing it in here with a brush. One beautiful thing about this photograph was these clouds. And uh, as we were on location, they just moved across the sky so beautifully. And down here, we have a slow-moving river. So we've got some nice elements here of, of uh, sky, land, and, and water. Down here, we have some green foliage. And I think that will pretty much be the composition. This right here maybe is too much in the center. So I'm going to move this big cliff over just slightly. If I were using watercolors, that would be totally opposite. I would always start with my lights and work to my darks. But on oils and acrylics, uh, generally speaking, I work from darks to lights. That's not necessarily a a rule that I follow all the time, but it's not a bad rule. And I most often follow that procedure from dark to light. I'm putting these in thin right now because I just want to establish the large patterns of this composition to see if they work for me. So I'm not worried about the color yet. I'm really worried about the values, which is the dark and light. So this establishes an overall look and overall pattern to the painting. And that's so very important to creating a, 
of painting is to get these large shapes in. I know I say that very often, but it's really the most important part of the entire painting is to get those lights and darks established properly. So right now I have my middle tone. It's the wrong color, of course, but the middle tone here of this burnt sienna, I have my darks. Now I need to put in some lights, but I don't want to put in the lights yet until I get some more subtle changes done in here. Let's put in a few more reflections down here from the uh, mountain. And these are acrylics. They're going to dry very, very fast. Being inside, they don't dry quite as fast. Outside, they'll dry almost instantly. Now this mountain is really a middle tone here, so that's about the right value. It's certainly not the right color. So I think I'll just go ahead and change that now and make that the right color. Now I'm going to, at this point, begin to add some white. Just taking some cerulean blue, yellow ochre, a little bit of everything. When I mix these colors, I don't always think about, well, exactly what colors I need. Uh, I've done it a lot, so a lot of it is intuitive, but I know it's a middle tone in here, and this palette is a middle tone gray, and this color I'm mixing is almost the same value as this gray palette. Now, I like to use this burnt sienna a lot of the times for uh, to tone my canvas because this burnt sienna gives the painting an overall feeling of warmth and glow. And uh, it really helps kind of set the mood of the painting. Now, I have a very blue sky up here, but I don't want to make that a real strong blue, I don't think, because the intensity of that blue sky may take away from the overall look of this painting in the mountain. I don't want all the attention brought up to this blue sky. So I'm going to change the blue sky. I'm still going to keep it blue, but I'm going to cut it back with some yellow ochre and some burnt sienna. And I just have to feel my way through this and just try and get the right color up there. Okay, well, that's, that's still blue, of course, but it's not a bright blue. And I'll show you, if I were to just mix ultramarine blue and white and put that up there, it would just be too overpowering for this painting. It would take away from the interest down here. So that's why I'm cutting back the intensity and color of that blue sky. So I have this dark set of clouds right down here, up in here, same thing. Now the lighter part of these clouds is going to appear warmer. So I'm going to take my white, add some yellow ochre to those, and start to put in a few of those here. Oh, and here's another thing. This is my spray atomizer. Very important for me to use that because that will just help these paints flow onto this masonite board a little easier. One good thing about the stage of the painting that it's at now is that everything is covered and I basically have my values established, my lights, my darks, and the middle tones, not, not necessarily the lights so much. And the main thing is I don't want to lose the big shapes here by putting in so many secondary shapes that, for instance, we have a big shape here. And I am going to put some more lights and darks in there, but overall I want that big shape to remain as a big shape and not to be broken up into so many small parts that I lose the feeling of this big shape. So I have to, have to hold myself back from using too many values that are outside of this range. I'm not sure about the patterns up here yet. I'll have to wait and see how that starts to play out. And we have a nice patch of light coming from back here. That really defines the edge of this cliff quite nicely. And another patch of light down here. This light was changing second by second. 
and I used the time lapse on my camera, and this is the particular frame I chose. I thought it was expressed this mountain about as good as any of the uh, time lapse. A little reflection down there. That water was just slowly moving, so there wasn't wasn't much uh, action in the water. Not very many ripples. I'll keep adjusting these lights and darks. Down here we have a very dark patch of trees. Then I'll take some yellow, mix with that blue, just give that a slightly green cast. Now in my painting here I am trying to show more of the water than is in my reference photograph because I think that's a nice feature. So I'm bringing the shoreline back some. Now I'll take that same green, I think I'll spray my board just a little, and with my brush dragging the strokes vertically, I'll just bring some reflection down from those trees back there. And of course there's a need the reflection of this mountain too, that goes all the way down here. And with some more green, there's a set of trees right here that go down to the water. And using my brush almost straight on to the canvas, I'll just flip that brush straight up. That will give a look of those branches and things pointing up towards the sky. And that reflection will head downstream right down here. Now reflections in the water like this, dark reflections will appear slightly lighter than the object being reflected. And light objects will appear slightly darker than the object being reflected. Back here, it's so far in the distance, it doesn't really apply or show too much, but it does a little. I'm mixing up a lighter green now, right in here, I see a lighter patch of uh, foliage that can sort of indicate the edge of the bank of the river. I'll just take that same color and I'll just flip that down a little bit into the water as well. So you can see how I'm trying to build all these values and tones a little bit at a time. I'm not trying to work and finish one area completely. I work on one area finish it to a certain point, then I'll move to another area, just so I can complete the painting all at one time. Now we have this darker foliage in the very foreground of the painting, but I don't want to get that very bright either because I don't want my attention to come down here. So um, even if the photograph were very bright green down here, I would most likely be changing that because I don't want the eye to come down into this area. I want the eye to stay up around here. If I were to put something really bright in down here, like that bright yellow, see my eye would just come down here and linger here, and it would take my eye away from the center of interest up here. So that's why I want to keep this dark and a little pushed back. I'm really starting to add, add color to this, and Right now, as I look at this, it almost might be too much color, but I'll leave it as it is for now until I start to adjust more of these areas back here. And these areas in the back, I want them to be pushed back so anything in the distance is going to get cooler in color. So I'm going to spray this and just flow a little bit of, of this cool color over these distant mountains. That will hopefully push those back in the distance. Now these mountains in the background here are darker than these mountains in the foreground. That's usually not the case, because as things go back in the distance, they generally get lighter uh, because of the atmosphere, but these mountains are fairly close together and it's darker because of the the clouds and these particular mountains back here are in shadow. So I'm going to keep those in shadow, but make them cooler. Now, if you look at my palette, you can see that all these colors are quite muted. And on this small palette space that I've used, uh, 
there's not any one particular color that jumps out. Right now, they're all pretty much, I, I would say, you know, harmonized colors, colors in harmony. I'm taking green here from the palette. There'd be reflected light from this green up on this side of this mountain, this cliff. So I'm dragging a little bit of that green up there. Doing things like this will tie this cliff to this area here. It will give me some harmony in here. So this just does not stop as one object and then the trees as another object. All these objects have to sort of fit together. So a little bit of green in there helps to tie these areas together. This is really where the main focus of the painting is going to be. It's time to add more lights. Wherever I want the center of interest to be, wherever I want the eye to go, I'll use more contrast than any other area. So dark against light will bring the eye to that particular area. So right here I'll have very dark, here I'll have quite a light area. Spray that, and then I can drag that reflection down a lot easier. I'm going to spray the top part here, work in these clouds more. You would think clouds would be one of the easiest things to create in a painting, but I've always found that clouds are one of the most difficult things that I have to paint. So let's leave those alone for a while now, and we'll jump to another part of the painting. I still have a lot of burnt sienna going on in here, too much. So let's try and get rid of more of that. A lot of times I use the side of my brush for this. Yeah, that's getting rid of a little more of that burnt sienna that I was so prevalent in the painting. But a lot of that still shows through. You can see a lot of that warmth still showing through, and that's what I wanted. I basically have all the large parts finished, so now I need to refine what I have here, start to bring it to more of a finish. We spent the night at one of the campgrounds in Dinosaur National Park, heading out for a drive on an unpaved road the next morning. Our goal, to find the petroglyphs, a lesser known treasure than the dinosaur fossil beds. And here they are. It was very, very exciting to see them and try to imagine what information they were meant to convey. You can easily identify some of the pictures and guess what they might mean. Perhaps these were early billboards for travelers like us. Unfortunately, I learned that many of the petroglyph sites are not listed on the park map due to vandalism. I can't imagine why anyone would tamper with them. We continued on our drive and were able to see these lizard petroglyphs from our window. You wonder how the artist reached this canvas up so high. At the end of the dirt road, we parked to explore Box Canyon. Roger set up his easel to paint the view before we started on our hike. The trail was an easy walk through a beautiful field once used for cattle ranching by a strong and resourceful frontierswoman named Josie Bassett Morris, who in 1913, without any financial resources, decided to build her own cabin and homestead here in Cub Creek, where she lived for more than 50 years. We traced her steps down into the craggy sandstone walls of the canyon. The trees made it a shady place to just be in the moment and listen to the wind rustling the leaves and tall grasses and flowers. I can understand why Josie never wanted to live anywhere else. There is a unique feel and sound to this place. On the way back, we saw what was causing the breeze, 
a storm was closing in, changing the colors of the landscape to muted tones. We took a few more pictures for future reference to remind us how quickly scenes can change, nature providing limitless variety. One reason I chose this particular frame from the uh, slow motion video was because I had this nice area here where I had a lot of contrast between the background of this mountain and more of the middle ground here of this big cliff, which brought this big cliff really into uh, a lot of focus, a lot of attention. Now, I don't see any light right on the top of this, but I am going to put a bit of light right on the top of this mountain here to define it. Right here, we have a very interesting plane. It's almost a flat triangular shape where the rock isn't quite as ragged as up in here. I see some warmth in those rocks. So I'm taking my titanium white touch of red and just put a little more color right in this area. This is where my center of interest is. So I want to refine this more than most other areas of the painting. Now this brush here is a bright, but it has a nice chisel edge on it. I can make a sharp line. Don't need a small brush to do this. I just use the edge of the brush to make any fine lines I need. So right now I'm just refining these areas, putting in the detail. Here we have this dark crack in this mountain, in this big rock. So that's darker there. I have to be careful not to get that too dark or else it will just bring too much attention to the area. So with a light touch, I'm just going to drag a few more areas where these rocks are cracked and split. All right, now we have a lot of sand and sort of beach area down here. I'm going to mix up a gray color. You can see a lot of these colors uh, are in harmony. I don't have any color in here that really screams and jumps out. So my sand down here, got some little beachy areas, and they're pretty much horizontal strokes, especially as they go back further. You know, one thing I could do to this painting, let's give it a try, is to put a nice patch of sunlight right across here. Let's try that, see if it works. It may bring too much attention to that area, but this is only paint, so if it doesn't work, just take it out. Okay, let's try that. Let's put, since we've got all these clouds anyway, this uh, the landscape here was changing frequently with the light and shadow. So just a little bit of green might just add some interest over here and a little more color to this painting. Well, this gives me a nice opportunity to continue this patch of sunlight right through and into the water. So this is sloping down. So this patch of sunlight would might start in here and cross over like that into the other shore. Well, I think that looks okay. So let me pick up on that more and this river goes around the bend here. So let's take a slice of that sunlight on the water and bring that up here. I'll echo a few of those brighter greens right here on the shore and put in their reflection. Now this mountain back here, I want that to be very flat. I don't want there to be much texture in there because all the texture and details on something that far away vanishes. So I would not want as much detail here as I have up here because it would look like it was on the same, same plane. So back here, I'm keeping this nice and subtle and soft with just a few different large shapes and planes in here. Now, generally speaking, there's always more contrast and color in the foreground, but in this case, I don't want to put that contrast and color in quite as much as it would be in, in real life, because I don't want 
all the attention brought down here. But I am going to put in a few more little strokes of uh, weeds and grass with a brighter color. You know, I'm going to mix a darker color too. Put in a few darker patches right back here in the foreground. Right in this area is very weak. So let's strengthen that. Maybe more contrast would help there as well. If I have too much texture everywhere in the painting, it just becomes too confusing. So one of the principles on a painting like this is always to try and simplify as much as possible. With my fan brush, a little more bright green right on the edge of the bank. And there were some type of white flowers in there. Don't know what they are, what they were, but just with the fan brush, going to just suggest a few flowers here. Now I have to be very careful putting in things like flowers because the painting can get a little bit too corny very quickly by putting in too much of that. I mean, it's not a floral painting, so I don't want to overdo that. I think that's enough. Maybe that's even too much. I'll spray this and let's work on those clouds. It's really difficult to get the appropriate pattern in these clouds. I always find these so difficult to do. And right over here to the left, I'll make these trees darker. That will just sort of put a stop sign on the edge of this painting to keep the eye from sort of falling off the edge. And to finish this, I'm putting a accent and highlight right on the edge up here at the top of the mountain. And that will finish this painting of our trip to Dinosaur National Park. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.